Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Let us start with the verse of the Quran. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. In fi khalqi samawati wal ardi wa khtilafi al-layli wa al-nahari la ayatin li ulil albab. Al-lazina yadhkuruna allaha qiyaman wa ku'udan wa ala junubihim. ويتفكرون في خلق السماوات والأرض ربنا ما خلقت هذا باطلا سبحانك فقنا عذاب النار ربنا إنك من تدخل النار فقد أخزيته وما للظالمين من أنصار ربنا إننا سمعنا مناديا ينادي للإيمان أن آمنوا بربكم فآمنا ربنا فاغفر لنا ذنوبنا وكفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار ربنا وآتنا ما وعدتنا على رسلك ولا تخزنا يوم القيامة إنك لا تخلف الميعاد فاستجاب لهم ربهم أني لا أضيء عمل عامل منكم من ذكر أو أنثى بعضكم من بعض فالذين هاجروا وأخرجوا من ديارهم وأوذوا في سبيلي وقاتلوا وقتلوا لأكفرن عنهم سيئاتهم ولأدخلنهم جنات ولأدخلنهم جنات تجري من تحتها الأنهار ثوابا من عند الله والله عنده حسن الثواب These are verses of سورة آل عمران and we're going to be discussing the last portion of them But I read from the beginning because that's where the theme and the content of that begins And essentially what's happening is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking about How in the heavens and the earth or in the creation of the heavens and the earth And the, and the changes of the night and day Is all a sign for the people who have intelligence For the people who have intelligence uh, and these are such people, it's the intelligent people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking about here are those he defines as in verse 191 of uh, surat, uh, of the surah is those who remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala standing, sitting and on their sides and they are reflecting over the creation of the heavens and the earth and then eventually I guess they're forced to say or they're compelled to claim, uh, to proclaim our Lord you've not created any of this redundantly and glorified are you, protect us from the hellfire. So they get from there and they, and, and they ultimately re remember hellfire and say, protect us from the hellfire. And then there's a series of du'as. Our Lord, uh, the one you enter into hellfire, then you have disgraced him. You've humiliated him. And there are no helpers for those who are oppressive. And then our Lord, uh, we heard the caller, and this is the interesting part. Uh, that, well, it's all interesting, but this is the pertinent part here That our Lord, we heard the caller calling to faith That bring faith with your Lord And thus, we embraced Islam You know, we uh, accepted Allah and we brought faith in Him Our Lord, uh, forgive for us our sins And remove our evils from us Our misdeeds from us And give us death with the righteous ones And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, again, there's another dua, which is our Lord, and give us or grant us what you have promised us uh, on the tongue of your messengers, and do not disgrace us on the day of judgment, and you never, um, you, you never uh, go against a promise. So then, their Lord accepted of them their supplications and answered them. And then he said, Never will I allow to be lost the work of any of you. Never will I allow the work of any of you, any deed that any of you have done to go in vain, to not be credited for, to not be 
evaluated and taken into account. Be you male or female? And this is the point that I want to uh, mention here. So, essentially, what this passage is doing, this last portion here, the verse 195 of this, I started reading from earlier, but verse 195, it's speaking about, uh, or just before that, it's actually speaking about believers invoking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the depths of their heart. And really just laying it out in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we heard your caller calling and we accepted it, we believed in you. And then there's a series of du'as, which obviously uh, people make to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after they have uh, taken faith. So, our Lord, verily we have heard the call of one of the prophets calling to faith, saying, believe to your, in your Lord, and we have believed. So now, our Lord, grant us what you promised to us through your messengers, and do not disgrace us on the day of resurrection, for you never break your promise. Now, that's a very significant point because then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fastajaba lahum Allah responded to them Allah accepted it from them right and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said very clearly not only am I accepting it from you I'm actually telling you that never will I ever let go to waste or unregarded any deed that you have done and then be you male or female after he said this, I mean, anybody reading this is going to assume that these are men speaking because it was probably men who said this, right? And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken into consideration uh, at the beginning, right? Because all of the verbs, etc., all the, the pronouns, they refer to men. So, I mean, you know, you'd be forgiven to be thinking that this is referring to men. It's a men who called and who said this and submitted this plea to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted from them. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes a very, very pointed reference to women as well, right? To make sure that women are included here and nobody ever misunderstands this, that this is only for men and this is not for women, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not disregard women in his response, even though that the supplication here was made by women. And that's why he said, min dhakarin aw untha, right? La udi'u amala aminin minkum. Min dhakarin aw untha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it a point to say that separately. And that just shows Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's boundless mercy on both men and women in his response. You see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator of both men and women. He is the creator of both of them. And he has affection for each one of them, for every one of them in the same measure, in equal measure. There's nothing that we can learn of anywhere in our sharia. Right, which shows that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which even implies that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves men more. Right? And th this is something that we just need to dispel. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts the supplications of both men and women equally. Right? Equally. I mean, for whatever purposes. It's not just because somebody's a man that he's going to uh, maybe accept their uh, supplication more uh, or for less of a reason or anything like that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows that he appreciates the sacrifices and the deeds and the efforts done by both men and women, right? And then he gives equal re reward to both men and women. So they both have an equal share in receiving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. And this is done without any kind of reservation, without any kind of preference given to one over the other. That's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for you. Now I know people may misunderstand this. There are, uh, you know, because men and women have complementary roles, and men get to do some of the leading, uh, the, the, the leading, like for example, be an imam and so on. You know, people think that that's discrimination, but that's just coming from a different perspective. That's not what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the roles for. Based on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's idea of what each of these roles are, what roles men are playing and what roles female are, are playing, uh, that there's, those are complementary roles for the continuation of humanity in this world and for the continuation and sustenance of the world. However, in terms of their contact with Allah, access to paradise, and becoming close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, doing deeds, they're both exactly the same. And that is why women should also give thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just as men should give thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them. Um, men can be admonished and men can be told off to have disregarded and neglected for you know, different times in history in different places in the world to have uh, uh, to have uh, neglected women right um, disregarded women um, uh, subjugated women 
uh, not given them their rights, uh, essentially not treated them well enough, and this is still the case in, in many parts of the world, right? Men can be admonished for that, right? Because men tend to be the stronger physique, uh, tend to be stronger and the more dominant kind of uh, 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 gender, and that's why maybe that, uh, you know, that's one of the reasons that that can happen. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not overlook that. Any injustice done to women, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not overlook, just like He will not overlook any other injustice to anybody else, right? So, uh, in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's scheme of things though, and this is what we need to understand, put into perspective, that men and women are interdependent. They are complementary to one another, and our social life is composed of both sexes, right? And in that sense, they're inseparable. You just can't have just men in this world. Right, as much as any man might even want that, you can't just have all women in this world, right? Uh, even if that's what some women want, right, or may want. Both uh, the, our social life, our survival in this world is composed of both sexes, and in that case, they have to be inseparable. So, the 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 verse though is not just talking about the life of this world when it says that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is never going to let any deed of any male or female go to waste. It's not talking about just this world. It's talking about the hereafter as well, which is even more important. So it's referring to both, that they will get their full reward, just like men will get their full reward, right? For any good that they've done in this world, any knowledge that they've acquired in this world, and any hard work that they put into this world. They both are going, it's meaningful coming from both of them. And this reward uh, is not deferred until the hereafter. They get a straight reward in the in this world first. You know, we get reward for the deeds that we do, right? For many of the deeds that we do, we get a reward either by the removal of a calamity or some other blessing in our life or some other opening in our life, some other comfort in our life, some other increase in our life. And both men and women get that. Men and women, both, m- Men, uh, in, in some cases, as I said, in some religious vocations, men have dominated and men have that position, right? Uh, for example, it's just easier for men to have participated in fighting in the jihad. And, uh, for example, to go and pray salat at night, you know, that's just sometimes easier for men, right? Or to fast maybe more regularly. But subhanAllah, I mean, women are not behind in that regard. You know, there may be some other things where men just find it easier because of maybe their social role that they play or whatever the case is. But that doesn't mean that the women cannot do that. SubhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives, you see there's a hadith in Bukhari which says, uh, from Aisha radiallahu anha, which says that the reward, your reward that you get is based on the effort that you put into it. So uh, if women find something more tough because they have the role of bringing up the children and dealing with that which is a very taxing uh, position, taxing role, then they will get extra rewarded for that because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just doesn't give on a mere action that this is how much reward you get, but there's all these multiplications and bonuses that you receive based on the effort, the sincerity, and the benefit, and the hardship, and, and everything that's associated with it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a very, very sophisticated system of rewarding. And then, of course, punish, punishment as well. So nobody will feel cheated on the Day of Judgment. Now let's look at another verse. And this time, it's actually from the chapter of women, the chapter on women, Surah Al-Nisa, a whole chapter on Surah Al-Nisa, which is a very, very important chapter. I'm going to re- I'm gonna start from the beginning. And these are the beginning verses, the opening verses of Surah Al-Nisa. يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسُ اتَّقُوا رَبَّكُمُ الَّذِي خَلَقَكُمْ مِنْ نَفْسٍ وَاحِدَةٍ وَخَلَقَ مِنْهَا زَوْجَهَا وَبَثَّ مِنْهُمَا رِجَالًا كَثِيرًا وَنِسَاءً وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ الَّذِي تَسَاءَلُونَ بِهِ وَالْأَرْحَامِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ عَلَيْكُمْ رَقِيبًا O oh mankind, O oh people, be, be dutiful to your Lord. Ittaqu rabbakum. Be dutiful, be conscious of your Lord. Gain taqwa and uh, acquire taqwa for your Lord. The one who created you from a single person. right? And from him he created his wife. Now he's talking about how men and women came into this world. So Allah created Adam a.s. first. And then from him he created his wife. And then it carries on says, And from them both he created many men and women. And fear Allah through whom you demand your mutual rights, through Allah whom you, uh, uh, and fear Allah, through whom you demand your mutual rights, 
and the wombs, basically meaning, and do not cut the relationship of the wombs, which means kinship. Surely Allah is ever a watcher over you. So what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here briefly is first have taqwa and be conscious and be fearful of this Lord who has created you. So this is the description of Allah. This is the description of our Lord that he's the one who created you from a single soul. And then after that, he created from that single soul, which is Adam alayhi salam, created his wife. And then from there, mashallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has spread so many people. We came literally just from two people. Right? And today the billions of humans in the world and the billions that have passed and the billions that will come, they've all come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creating one man and one woman. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says that be careful and uh, fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with regard to your kinship because you share with one another. This is who you are. Right? This is what your inter you know your inter family relationships are. You must observe them and you can't break them because that's who you are, that's your social life. That's your social fabric of your society. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ever watchful over you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. So now, again this surah underscores the important status accorded to women in Islam. And I guess, I mean, it's, it's an obvious point. So why do we say this and why do people mention this? The reason we have to keep mentioning this is because we've had major disparities in human civilizations. So before Islam, you know, we had in time of Jahiliyyah and in other traditions... For, you know, for a very, very long time, you had where the women were considered to be completely inferior. They had no rights. They couldn't own their own, uh, they, they couldn't own their own properties and so on and so forth. And then af after that, you've got today where uh, the, the, the Western uh, liberalism has gone to such a degree that it's gone well beyond any kind of boundary. And thus, uh, where Islam was championing this whole cause, now it's made to seem as if it is subjugating women because it doesn't want to give unbridled rights to both men and women, right? So there's a bit of confusion in that. And that's why we have to keep talking about that the Quran speaks about the important states. And, but it does speak about them. It does single them out for discussion in that regard. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this particular verse speaks about the mutual roles, right? The complementary roles, the mutual roles and their obligations, right? And the fate of mankind, subhanAllah, mark these words, the fate of mankind is actually uh, is interlinked uh, between men and women, right? They are two parts of the same body. They differ obviously slightly and there is a physical appearance, etc. However, all of this has been, you know, even the differences between men and men, women, what's really interesting about that is that that's been done to facilitate their pleasant relationship and for them to be able to fulfill the purpose and the role for which each one has been created, right? Most of the objectives of both of them are the same, but in some, men are better at it and women are better at some other things. So what's really interesting here is that everybody came from a single soul, which is Adam alayhi salam. That's just amazing. From a single soul, that was Adam alayhi salam. And then from Eve, from Hawa alayhi salam. And mashallah, men and women are fellow travelers in this particular phase of life, this world, this dunya. And they account for the multiplication of the human life. Can you imagine it? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed the companionship of Adam alayhi salam and Hawa alayhi salam, infused them with love for one another, right? Gave them love for one another. And as a result, they grew into the thousands and then presently into the billions. Subhanallah, just because of that love and uh, affection that comes from there. This, we must get an understanding of this, uh, a guidance from this for our own marriages. That at the end of the day, a marriage is based on love and that is the love that Allah places there. If you do things to destroy that love, to put a barrier not to carry out that love, both husband and wife, and you don't do that, then you are going against God's plan. And that's why it's important to, for us to carry that, uh, carry that on. Now, this, the Quran is probably the first book to show how humans are so interlinked. It probably was a radical idea to show that we're so interdependent, right? And uh, the, the, basically, you can't have some humans who are completely and absolutely masters of others. Right, in a sense that they don't have any relay, a responsibility towards the others. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's system in this world is such that if there's a ruler, then while they have to demand obedience, at the same time they also are responsible for providing services. Just to look at a teacher-student uh, relationship. The teacher is there 
in the uh, higher position of imparting knowledge, but then their responsibility is to nurture their student, to mark their assignments, to make sure they learn. There's a responsibility attached. You cannot have, and if there is anybody in this world, and there are people who seek to have that kind of domina dominance in this world, which is completely unbridled, no responsibility towards anybody else. They want to just suck from everybody else and become the, 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 the controllers of everything. That is not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's plan for this world, and that will fail. That does not work that way. right? You just can't have that. We are interdependent. Uh, yes, we can have positions of authority, but they, they are positions of responsibility. They're not positions of absolute dictatorship where nobody, where, where we don't owe something back to people. And that is one thing that we must keep in mind. And so likewise, it's the same thing. Men cannot lead, or uh, on another point here, men cannot lead a natural, happy life without women. And similarly, it's true of women that they cannot happily lead a life without a male partner. Eventually, there comes a time in life where people regret this. I know people who didn't marry because they were really uh, into their teaching or studying or some other vocation, but eventually they always feel lonely. There are feminists who've given up uh, having children, uh, having a husband or being able to maintain a husband, and now they are lonely. They are lonely and they are recanting many of the, uh, the, the arguments that they would put forward before. But remember, this society can only be successful according to the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that's the name through which or that's whom uh, we come together by. He's our creator and it's for his sake that uh, we do this. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, based on this, to maintain our kinship, which means our family ties and uh, focus on that. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us rewards, promised rewards. The Prophet has promised us rewards for maintaining ties of kinship. Uh, those who break the ties of kinship are considered to be condemned in this world. They lose barakah, they lose blessing, right? And uh, those who do good, they're given longer life, they're given blessing in their life, they're given uh, 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 a better quality in life. These are all the, uh, these are all the pro promises. You have to remember the husband wife relationship is such that it is mar it sometimes becomes many times actually becomes much stronger than a relationship of a uh, uh, with with one's parents right it becomes much stronger because there are certain characteristics of relationship with the wife it's so intimate there's no other relationship that is that intimate it's intimate in every sense there's a frankness, there's a transparency, there's a naturalness. And that's just inconceivable in some cases, even with one's parents. So that's why this is something that needs to be invested in, to do well in, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us. And, of course, the other thing which we're told uh, in the Quran is, Hunna libasul lakum wa antum libasul lahun, That they are your garments and you are their garments. right? Which is a really important metaphor to show that you cover one another, you protect one another. And that is the role that uh, we, we are speaking about. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows in the Qur'an that women are equally as important as men and men cannot survive without women and women cannot survive without men. In fact, the human race cannot continue. And that is part of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's uh, design. And the main point is that both are equal in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they are, that, that they uh, can worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and draw as close to Allah as each, as each other. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to draw close to Him and allow us to encourage one another to do the same thing. And may Allah not allow us to be an obstacle in this, in, in this regard. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all and bless us all. Jazakallah khair. Keep us in your du'as. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, the point of a lecture is to encourage people to act, to get further, an inspiration, an encouragement, persuasion. The next step is to actually start learning seriously, to read books, to take on a subject of Islam and to understand all the subjects of Islam, at least at their basic level, so that we can become more aware of what our deen wants from us. Uh, and that's why we started uh, Rayyan courses, so that uh, you can actually take organized lectures uh, on demand whenever you have free time, especially, for example, the Islamic Essentials uh, course that we have on there, the Islamic Essentials Certificate, which you take 20 short modules. And at the end of that, inshallah, you will have gotten the, the basics of 
uh, most of the most important topics in Islam and you'll feel a lot more confident. You don't have to leave lectures behind. You can continue to, leave, uh, you know, to listen to lectures, but you need to have this more sustained study as well. Jazakallah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.